Father, you are a great God. Father, you just love us so much. You care about us so much. Father, we're on a journey together with you through by the Holy Spirit. And I just thank you, Jesus, that you are our destination. You're our beginning and our end, Lord. I thank you for that, Jesus. You love us so much. Each one here, Lord, you love. I mean, your, the depth of your love, Lord, is amazing. And there might be people here, Lord, that are wondering, just how much do, do you love me, Lord? But try and think of the biggest amount that you can even think of and then triple it, and that won't be even come close. Lord, because your love is just so amazing. It's so amazing and so powerful. And Lord, you, want us, you, you love us, Lord. And you want us to feel it, Lord. You want us to feel your love, Lord, and, and feel your presence and know what it means, Jesus. Why? Because you love us. You're so caring. Lord, I thank you for everybody that's here. We're all here for a reason, Lord, and that's to hear from you. And Jesus, I just ask that, you would, that, you, that I could just have the privilege, Lord, of you just speaking through me this morning, reaching the hearts of the people that you want your, your word to go to, Lord. You are amazing, Lord. And I do thank you for everything that you're doing in each person's life, Lord. You've got our best interests at heart, Lord. and you've, Everyone here is special to you, and I thank you, Lord. In your name I ask this and pray. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Has anybody got any WD-40? <laughs> because it's been a while, and I might, <laughs> I might be a little bit rusty around the edges, but hey... That doesn't matter. That's no problem at all. I hope everybody's okay. I hope everybody's doing well. I mean, we're on a journey. The Holy Spirit is leading us on that journey. Where there's a journey, there's always a destination. And he wants us to get there. He wants us to make it. He wants each one of us to make it. And the only way we're going to make it is by staying in him. With the Holy Spirit's power enabling you, you can't do it by yourself. That's what we've been taught these past, well, few weeks particularly, but you just can't do it by yourself. It's only by God. It's only by his Spirit. He's the one that's effectually working in you, within you, all the time, even when you can't see it. Isn't that amazing? Even when you can't see it. He loves you so much. And I hope that, like Darren said at the beginning, that you're actually... You know, you know, like when you get a skill, you've got to practice it, haven't you? You've got, to, you've got to do something with it. And I'm not talking about a skill in this sense, but what I am saying is that we have to do something with the things that we've been taught. I mean, we have to grab hold of it and say, Lord, how do I use this? How, how do I do this? And he's the one, so you've got to be looking up to him to say, how does it work, Lord? He's the one with the instructions. So I hope that that's what you've been doing that these, these last couple of weeks, that you've been trying to put these things into practice, trying to get closer and closer. When I say try, I mean try in the right way. I don't mean in your own efforts. To get more and more intimately, like Darren said, acquainted with the Holy Spirit, because without him, you are nothing. You're, you're nothing without him. Oh, yes, in the world you can make yourself something. You can, right? But the world does not give you hope. And the world does not promise you a future. I'll tell you what the world does. It says, every man for himself, dog eat dog, you've the, you're the one that's got to do things for yourself. That's what the world does. You're the one that has to strive to be something. In God, you don't strive to be something. You relax and let him make you into something. That's amazing. That can only happen in one place, and that's in his presence. Darren, Darren mentioned this a couple of Sundays ago, three, three Sundays ago, I think it was, when I was looking. He said, you might be a mess. Right. And, and to some extent, we all are. But we're his mess. His mess. And that is amazing. And I hope that you've actually dwelt on that and thought, you know, I, it's him. I'm his mess. He's the one that's going to fix me. And where is he going to fix you? On the wheel. I mentioned this in house group the other day. The wheel, the, do, you, do you know you're just clay? You know, in, 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 in the metaphor or in the, in the picture, you're just clay. What are you going to do? You're going to make yourself into something? You can't do that. How can, you, you, need, you need your hands to be made for a start off. Right, So God's going to make your hands. So if you're just clay, you can't make yourself. Oh yeah, you've tried to reinvent yourself numerous times, probably in the flesh. 
Right, but you're just clay. Do you realize there's nothing more humble than clay? It isn't anything. It doesn't pretend to be anything. It says, it just, just put me in the center of your wheel. Splosh, right in the center there. That's it. And you just cooperate. Yes, you come with all of your issues out of the world, but you're there now. You're in the center. He picks you up and he turns the wheel. I've been watching the pottery throwdown, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> he does that with the wheel. So the wheel's spinning. What does he do? He doesn't put you on the edge. Well done, you've just made it. No. He picks you up. Where does he put you? Right smack bang in the center. He centers you in the center for a reason. Because that's the best place where he can work. In you, where he can, where he can do his thing. We need to be in that place. We need to be centered on his wheel. And the most important thing is that we need to stay there. Staying on his wheel means staying in his presence. It means staying in his will. Now look, on that wheel, the further you go away from the center, the more the burden is going to get a little bit harder and the more, sorry, the more the, let me get this right. What is it, the scripture about the, the burden and the yoke? The more the yoke is going to get harder and the burden is going to get a little bit heavier the further away you are from that center. Right? So what happens, alarm bells start. That's what the Holy Spirit will do. He loves you so much. If you're veering off center, he'll make an alert. He'll just say, hey, hey. I'm getting your attention. Let's just get back to where we, where we, where we, where I can work with you, right? So, I don't know how you've come this morning. Some people might feel, yeah, I'm smack bang in the centre. It's, it's amazing. It's fantastic. God's brilliant, and He is. Some of you might be a little bit further towards the edge. I don't know. And you know what happens when you're on a wheel in the centre? You might be going round, but you don't. You're all right. When you take a step there, oh, you start to feel it. Don't you? Come on. Those people that have been on the, fair, the fairgrounds or, the, or the, play, the playgrounds where you're on the little roundabout and things like that. And then you're on the edge. And then as a kid, it's great being on the edge, isn't it? Right? You're on the edge and you fling it. You're out, you're out like that, you know, whizzing around like that and you're on the edge. But it's not great to be on the edge like that in, on his wheel. That's not where you want to be. You want to be in the centre. Right? So what I'm saying is I don't know where you are. Some of you might feel, yeah, I'm where God was, right in the centre. And some of you might be feeling a little bit overwhelmed. Some of you might feel that oh, I've got so much going on, so many plates being on, or whatever it is, where the yoke's starting to get a little bit hard and the burden's starting to just get a little bit more heavy. And some of you might be actually on the edge with your legs flung out, going round and round and round and like that, you're desperately holding on. Some of you might have let go. Some of you might not be on the wheel, which Darren was alluding to before. The point is, the wheel, that is the best place to be, because that's where he is, that's his presence. When he, that's the place where you're his mess, but you're his mess centered in the middle of it, where he can get his hands on you and do his work in wonder work in power in your life. So... Like I say, I, I don't necessarily know where, where you are, but if some of you are feeling overwhelmed, or if some of you feel like you're just clinging on like that, or if some of you feel like you've just slipped, or if some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, about being on God's wheel, there's hope. There's hope for you. Why is there hope for you? Because God promised us hope for you. God's the one who says, my thoughts, my thoughts to you. I want everybody to grasp hold of this this morning. He has special, specific thoughts for you as an individual that might be different to the person that speak, that, that, that's right next door to you right now, but they're special to you, thoughts. Jeremiah 29, 11. Just have a quick peep at that. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified. This is God now saying, this is God, and I want you to, I want you to imagine this now. Not imagine, no, not imagine. I don't want you to imagine it. I want you to hear it. I want you to hear what God's saying to you, like his thoughts for you right now, right here, right? This is what God's saying. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you. 
It's not like he's making it up as he goes along. You on the, on, on the wheel thinking, oh, what shall I do? I have no idea. I'll try this or I'll try that. No, he already knows the thoughts and plans he had for you before he put you in the middle of that wheel. He knows the plans. His thoughts to you are innumerable. They're amazing. They're fantastic. But they're for you. And the plans that he has for you, I know them, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil but to give you hope in your final outcome I know some um, versions of the Bible sort of give it almost like a prosperity thing where um, you know you'll have I don't know whatever you have but we're talking about welfare and peace and the hope for your future That's that's what the Holy Spirit will give you being centered on his wheel. Doing the things, just to, just being humble, saying, look, I'm just a piece of clay. Stop trying to resist God with your bright ideas or the things you want to be or the things that you want to, that, that, that are in you, that you want to keep in you. Because those things are going to go on the wheel. Right? They're going to go on that wheel. He's going to turn you into what he, what he wants to make you. All right? Because he already has the blueprint for your life. He already knows what his thoughts and his plans are. You're just, you're, you just get the privilege of, of seeing those things being worked out in you. How amazing is that? But I don't know where you are. So some of you might be holding on, barely holding on. Some of you might have let go and are actually walking in darkness. Or some of you may have not know God at all, have never experienced God. The point is there is hope available for you today. Darren said this a couple, of, a couple of weeks ago, maybe. You're so close. It's a heartbeat away. That decision to say, Lord, Lord, I'm just, I give you everything. I give you my life. I humble myself before you. Everything, it's yours. I come with a repentant attitude and humility. Jesus, I just raise up my arms. I submit myself to you. That is just a prayer away. Now, if you're not too sure, if, you, if, you're, if you're on that wheel and you, you, your legs are dangling out and you're screaming, ah, I just want to stay on the wheel, or wherever else you might be, like I said, there's hope, and you're not the first person to feel that. David felt that. King David, he felt that numerous times. If you've got your Bibles, please turn to um, Psalm 40. Psalm 40. And again, I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible. I love this bit. Just the first verse is incredible. So I don't know what situation uh, David was in at the time. I have no idea. It doesn't really tell you. It does tell you a little bit later on in the... In, in, the, um, in that psalm that um, his, he, you know, he felt the weight of his iniquities, they, over, they, they, they were over, overtaking him like, like the hairs on his head type thing. So maybe it was that, I don't actually know. But the point is that David knew God. He knew, he believed, he, he, he knew that if he asked God, if he, if, he, if he repositioned his heart to God, that God would hear him, that God would would bring him back, that God would throw that lifeline and he would, he would be back in there with God. He knew it by experience. Now, some people here might not know that by experience because some people here might still, still feel, like Darren said the other week, that, you know, that you're so busy looking at yourself and how bad do you think you are that you, you don't believe you can get back on the wheel when you can because God's promised that you can. Verse 1 says, this is David now saying, I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord. What's the opposite to that? I wait unpatiently. Right? As in, God, why aren't you doing this? God, why aren't you doing this? God. Have you ever thought of, there's a, there's a reason why you might have to wait patiently. There might be a reason why you have to wait patiently because it might be that you have to humble yourself just that little bit more. God sees your heart, don't forget. It might be that you, you're just not believing it, there's, there's a hundred reasons why you might have to wait patiently. It might be that you have to reposition your heart because of where you are. But the point is that David learned to wait patiently. 
He waited patiently, but this is the other bit. Now, it says it in the Amplified. And expectantly. Expect How many people here really wait upon the Lord expectantly? I hope that's a lot. I hope that's everybody. Right? Because... If you're feeling overwhelmed, or if you're feeling like you're barely hanging on, or if you feel like you've let go, or if you feel like, you, you know, you're such a bad person, like has already been mentioned, then it's difficult to have that expectancy, isn't it? Unless you, if you don't believe. And this is what I'm saying. David believed that I, I'm going to wait on you, Lord, and I'm going to expect you to move. I know you're going to hear me. Lord, I'm crying out for you. Whatever situation I'm in, Lord, I cry out. Please hear my cry, Lord. But it wasn't in vain. He knew God was going to hear him, and he waited patiently and expectantly. And that's what's really important. That You see, that's a believing heart. If you really believe that God is going to rescue you, he will rescue you. He will, you will have that hope that he talks about. I waited patiently and expectantly for the Lord. And he inclined to me and he heard my cry. That was the outcome. The Lord inclined his ear down to David and said, I hear you. I hear you, son. And he knew it. David knew it. And then it goes on to say, he drew me up out of the horrible pit, a pit of tumult and of destruction, out of the miry clay. Anybody ever felt like that? Does everybody know what miry clay feels like? Have you ever been there, miry clay? I have. When I was a kid, I used to live in Grange, not that too far away. And you know Grange has an open air swimming pool? You all know it, Lynn, won't you? And um, as a kid, it was great. We'd just come out of the pool, and then I was walking along the prom on the way home. And, we'd, and there's the bay, of course. And we'd, so we're into the, in the bay, not the water, just the sand. And then, as kids, you do this. Come on, who hasn't done this on Morecambe Bay? Oh, you're looking at me like you haven't done it. Come on. <laughs> that. And what happens? You start, you start seeing your toes disappear. Oh, it's fun, this, isn't it? And then you do it a little bit more, and then you start seeing your ankles disappear. And then you do the test. And the test is, does it come out or doesn't it? <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, I'm still safe. And you go a little bit deeper, and your friends are egging you on a little bit more. Go a little bit deeper, Dave. Yeah, all right. And so you're doing that. And all of that sounds fun, doesn't it? It's, it's like fun as a kid in, in that situation. Advised. Definitely not advised. No, 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 yes. Thank you, Darren. Definitely not advised. But what I'm saying is, you know the feeling of, of wanting to escape, but something's sucking you back down again. Now, as a kid in that situation, yeah, it was all great. It was all fun. Until you couldn't do it. Until that didn't work. And then your mate had to get you out of trouble. You know, a bit of digging. Why am I saying that? The point is, miry clay is just like that. Whether the miry clay you feel is because you're just dragging on and you've got so much going on, you don't know what to do and you don't know how to get back into the centre, or whether you're off the wheel and you can't believe that you can get in, or whatever it is, that miry clay is not, it's not nice. It sucks you down. It tries to keep you where you were. You're not grounded. You're not on anything solid. David knew that. Out of the miry clay, he drew me. We've had the picture that Darren gave the other week about, about God with the, with the life ring, throwing it out to you. And all your, you're crying out to God and you're waiting patiently and here he comes and he throws it out to you. And your, your responsibility at that moment in time is to just grab hold and do nothing else. Why? Your prayers have been answered. The repositioning of your heart and the cry of your heart of, Lord, I've got a repentant attitude and humility is being answered. The, the life rings there. All you've got to do is grab hold of it. That's all he's asking you to do. Not pull yourself in. He will then pull you in, like we've already heard. He will pull you in by his Holy Spirit. David knew his rescuer. And what did God do then? He set my feet. This is David talking. And he set my feet upon a rock. Upon a rock, solid ground, a place where you can build your house. If you try to build your house in that miry clay when the storms come, that house isn't going to stand. Solid ground, on the wheel, in his presence, that's where your building plot is. Build your house. He will do it, I mean, not you. Let He will then build your house there. That's the place for your house to be, in him. On the wheel. 
set my feet upon the rock. Jesus is our rock. Then I just love the way the Amplified opens this up more. It says, steadying my steps. Steadying my steps. An unsteady step is like, you know, like you're feeling for the ground. Is it, is it safe? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's taking my weight. What about that? But is it, it's unsteady. When you're on the rock, test it. Run around in it. You're on the rock, steadying your steps, establishing my goings. I mean, if that's not the Holy Spirit talking to you through this, I don't know what is establishing. Establishing your goings. The way, his way. It's like the Holy Spirit is just leading you, directing you, establishing you, taking into, taking to wherever it is that he wants you to go. And when you've done it, when you've been rescued like that, when, when you just grab hold of that life ring and he's, he puts, it's like he grabs hold of you, right? And he puts you bang, slap, bang in the middle of that wheel again. <sighs> there I am, that's where I need to be. No resisting. You can't resist, you're, you're clay, remember? No resisting. Yeah, but what about all my sin? Like, well, it doesn't matter. You're there in the centre. He covers all of that like Darren said. All he wants now is your cooperation because what does he want to do with you? He's going to caress, he's going to, in the right way. Now, please don't misunderstand. He's going to caress you in the right way. He's going he's to put his hands on you. He's going to form you. Yes, it might mean a little bit of pinching here and there. When you look at a potter doing some, you're a lump of clay, so he's got to get hands on. He's got to do something to form you into something. So when you're there, you might feel, ooh, ooh, right? And what is that? That's just something that the God is it's changing you, it's making you, it's pruning you. It might not feel great at the time, but you've got to know that he knows what he's doing. Why? Because he's got the blueprint. He knows what he's going to make you into be. So when you're like, so it's like, he knows the thickness you need to be. I don't mean thickness. I mean, he knows the thickness you need to be. He knows, um, he knows the angle that you need to have. He, he, he's going by his blueprint, the thoughts that he has for you. He knows how much pressure to apply at any one time. He knows how much pressure you can handle at any one time. He's not going to make you in one, in one foul swoop like that. It's going to be a period of time where he's going to do that in you, in your life. So you might feel a pinch. You might feel a squeeze. You might feel a lob of water coming on you and you're getting wet. Right, as he, as, he, as he does these things in you. But remember, now going back, his mess. Right? Clay is messy stuff. Right? So he's, you, you're right in the center with all the things that need to change, and he will do that. He will do, if you stay in the center, he'll take away the things that, aren't, that shouldn't be there. You just have to cooperate. Right? And he'll deal with the things that he's asking you to deal with. And as long as you're doing that, you're safe. He's turning you into something beautiful, something special. I mean, a masterpiece. You're not all the same. Each one is turning you into something that's different to the person next door. But all with the same heart. All with the same mind. All done by the same Holy Spirit. Him effectually at work in you all the while. His wonder-working power in you. Dave go, David, Dave, oh, sorry, not. David goes on to say, goes on to say, and he has put a new song in my mouth, the song of praise to our God. How many of you people, how many of you feel that when God puts you right in the center again? When you feel the weight of your own problems, your, your, your own issues, where he puts you and centers you back on that wheel. All you want to do is say, thank you, Lord. Why he puts, that's the first thing he does in you. He puts his joy and his peace back into, into you, where you just say, Lord, thank you. And, you. and words, praise come out to him. Why? Because he's your God, he's your maker. And you want to express that joy to him. No wonder he puts a new song in David's mouth. And then David says, Many shall fear and, and revere and worship and put their trust and confidence and reliance in the Lord. Why? Because Dave knows that, David knew that that was the, you know, that he'd experienced that so many times. That, that, and that's what he did. It's like the, it was like he was saying it to the readers later on, thousands of years, that through this experience, you will learn to put your trust into God, your reliance into God, into the Lord. Goes on to say, blessed. 
you're on the wheel. You submitted to him. There's no hidden agenda. If there's hidden agendas, they will be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be shown up, right? You just have an attitude of cooperation. You are blessed in that place. In the Amplified, it says, happy and fortunate, even to be envied, being in that place, is the man who makes the Lord his refuge and his trust and turns not to, pr- to the proud or to the followers of false gods. And then in verse 5, similar to the, to the verse in Jeremiah, David says, many, O Lord my God. David recognized this. I want you to know this today, the thoughts that God has towards you. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonderful works which you have done. The wonderful works and the thoughts towards us. Many. No one can compare with you. If I should declare and speak of them, they're too many to be numbered. His thoughts towards you, you know, you, you, you won't be able to count them. His thoughts towards you, you, you probably won't even be able to believe it. But believe it. Believe it. When he says, my thoughts towards you are more than you can imagine. My plans for your life are greater than you could even imagine. Yes, I might need to do a little bit of pressing, a little bit of squeezing, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, taking things up, pruning, and all of the things whilst you're on that wheel. And yes, there's times of testing when the heat's on because every piece of clay goes through the kiln, right? So there's times of testing. But it's not like clay in the world sense, once it's gone through a kiln, you can't do anything. God will test you and, and, uh, and there'll be fire and, be thick and that sort of thing. But he's still able to, once it's out there, he's still able to mould you and take out what's not right and what's right. Because you're a work in progress. You're never a finished work. So God knows what he's doing with your life. When he says his thoughts to you, grab hold of them and believe his thoughts. Otherwise, you're always going to believe a thought. But it's which thought are you going to believe? You're going to believe the devil's lies or his thoughts? Because his thoughts to you are the ones that are true. The devil's thoughts are always going to be lies. Verse 6, David goes on to say, Sacrifice and offering you, don't desert, you, you do not desire, nor do you have any delight in them. You have given me the capacity to hear and obey. Isn't that amazing? If any of you were sat here today thinking, right, all right, well, yeah, Okay, David's speaking, I know, and I, and I can sort of hear. What you need to know is God has given you the capacity to hear and obey. If you're sat here today, he has. If, you, if, you're, if, if, you're, if, you, if you've decided to jump onto his wheel, if you've decided to grab hold of that life ring, and you've decided to let him pull you in, right, he gifts you with that. He gifts you with that. The capacity to hear and obey. Burnt offerings, sin offerings, anything that you think you can give God by way of, of a recompense or, 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 or God to say, well, thanks for doing that, God, here's a present. It's a waste of time, right? <laughs> it's just a waste of time. He's given you the capacity to hear and obey. But you've got to believe that. You've got to believe that by the Spirit, that that is true that you can hear the voice of the Lord in that place and that you've got the capacity to obey it. Why? Because of something that you can do within yourself? No. No, if you try and obey it at your own strength, you're going to get flung off the wheel. Right? Very quickly, you're going to go across towards the edge. It's not about that. It's about staying in his will. You've been given the capacity to hear and obey. That means you need to obey on the wheel, in the hands of the potter, him shaping you. And as he's shaping you, he's, he's, he's giving you commandments, things to do, where you just need to obey. It's the Holy Spirit that's doing the work all the while, effectively working within you. You just need to cooperate. That's what I'm saying. There's too many people that aren't cooperating. You, you, there's too many people that are, that are, that are doing the, their own thing. The potter's wheel is the place where we need to be centered in his will. goes on to say in verse 8 
I delight in your will, my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. And he writes his laws in your heart. He writes them in your head. Right? That's why we, we have that ability to hear him and obey him. So I don't know how you, how you are today or how you've come today, but what I'm saying is there's hope for you wherever you are. If you're in the centre, stay in the centre. If you're slightly off kilter, get back into the centre. There's hope. Cry out to God. God will hear you. Wait patiently. Be expectant. Believe what God says about you. Listen to his thoughts. He will bring you smack bang in the centre of his will where you, the only force is him. Right? At work to do his good pleasure through you. So, um, it's, it's an encouragement, is this, right? Even David knew. Even David knew in those times where he's, uh-oh, Lord. I mean, Lord, please help me. With a believing heart, he knew. I'm just going to wait patiently. I'm just going to wait patiently. I'm expecting. And God did it. And then he took him out of the miry clay. He rescued him. God, David knew the rescuing God. So, Let's make sure that we just take hold of that, that life ring. That he pulls us right. He's in the centre, so he's going to pull you to the centre. Just, just do the holding and the gazing, and he'll do the work. And keep you on that place where we can enjoy the journey together, where we'll get to that destination through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. His way, his power effectively at work within you. So... If you feel like you need, you know, you need to get on that wheel, then please get on the wheel. It's a prayer away. It's not hard. It's not difficult. You've got to believe. Use the faith, which is a gift that he gave you to begin with. Use it and believe. He loves you. His thoughts towards you. Amazing. More probably than the sands of grain on the seashore or the number of stars in the sky. So I hope that's an encouragement to you this morning. There is hope. Please do what I'm saying if that's what you really need to do. Amen? Amen. Amen.